So uh, welcome to our talk. I'll get situated here soon and get into a good flow with you guys. Okay. So um, I'm going the talk itself, I'm just going to give like a minute of background. I'm going to touch a little bit on permaculture because for me, it's like a really important that I'm communicating the process and kind of the considerations and the decision making because everybody's situation is really different. Um, so I wouldn't expect that anybody would replicate exactly what we did. There's no way you would. Um, so that I just want to um, touch a couple minutes on that. And then I'm going to give you guys a little bit of context about the whole water system on the farm and how the pond fits into that. And then we'll go through um, like our rehabilitation of the pond as we did it during the SARE grant. And um, there will be room to kind of discuss things um, as that we're planning to do going forward. Um, so that's kind of the really general thing. So just a minute of background on ourselves. Um, the farm is Purple Brown Farmstead. We started as part of the Countryside Initiative Program in 2016. Um, that's uh, just a really general topo map um, of where our property sits. And it is on a ridge in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. It is uh, like Western facing mild gentle slope. Um, and the whole concept for uh, us starting this farm is that it was a permaculture design. So we'll touch a little bit on that. Um, but so it's a really diversified fruit orchard, uh, like mulched and contour. You know, there's a lot of keywords that we throw out there underneath that umbrella of regenerative agriculture, but we just kind of really applied it to our specific landscape and our specific community. Um, so in 29, uh, in, we started in 2016. The grant for the stair for the actual pond rehabilitation was 2019 and 2020. That was the project cycle. Um, our farm was certified organic in 2021. I'm very proud of that. Um, and we also opened up a, a Purple Brown Farm store in Peninsula, Ohio. I'm just going to do a shout out if you guys are looking uh, to see how local food is being done in Northeast Ohio. We've got a thing going on. Um, so we'd love support and feedback on that. Um, so we're going to talk mostly about the activities in 2019 and 2020 as they relate to the pond. Um, that's going to be like the bulk of the talk here. Um, so. Mm -hmm. uh, on the, so your contours is uh, basically just your level lines. Um, anywhere your ground is level, that's your contour. It is perpendicular to gravity. Um, so if you're on a hillside and you're walking a straight line without going uphill or downhill, that's your contour. Uh, the goal for this presentation, oh, I, I should go to the next slide here is I would like to summarize and share what I have learned in five years of farmer research, rehabilitating an old farm pond from virtually becoming a bog as an integral part of the whole farm watershed with a fair focus. Um, the key words here is that this is farmer research, um, AKA this is not an advanced seminar. Um, so if you guys are looking for like really deep technical stuff, I don't, you're not gonna um, hear too much of that for me. Um, Another key word is that this is a farm pond versus like a bog or a wetland. Um, we're going to touch on all of those things, but wetlands are very valuable. They're very diversified ecologies. Um, but on the other hand, this is not like a defend the you know pond seminar. Um, our situation is that the pond is the right solution for us. Um, so, you know, that's just for consideration that there's other um, parts of like water conservation and other tools like swales. Um, that we're going to discuss. Um, the watershed is that, you know, no pond lives alone. Uh, water comes in and water goes out. It is uh, a part of a water system. So uh, it's really important for us to think of it in those terms. Um, I would like to give a shout out to SARE, acknowledge that um, as the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. Um, they funded our two-year project. Uh, it was Really great. Um, they really incentivized me to take this project very professionally and seriously. <clears throat> Excuse me, and like do the appropriate research and um, you know kind of have that external accountability uh, to do it right. And then the fact that they really validate farmer research um, is really important because farmers do make great researchers. We do it all the time, whether we think we do or not. We're always observing. We're always reading the landscape. 
and nature and responding to it. So um, that is an essential part of research and um, it's really great that they publish this kind of stuff. Um, on that note, I will also thank OFA for partnering with Sarah to allow me to present here today and share this. Um, hopefully somebody, everybody will learn a little something that they can take away. And, um, you know, so for me, why it was really important to do this research and share this information is, um, you know, we moved on to uh, an old farm, you know, that had this old farm, uh, it, it's agriculturally zoned pond. And, um, and I didn't know anything about water or pond management. And as I really wanted to do a good job, you know, like permaculture design, right? Like we're doing this whole thing. Um, there wasn't really a lot out there for me to go on, right? Like we're not a conventional farm. So there's plenty of research about like, well, if you've got livestock and you've got a lagoon, you know, this is how you manage it. This is how you finance it, et cetera, right? And on the other hand, we're not just a recreational ecological pond Then we would, you know, have like ODNR as a resource, even though their, you know, their guidance is relatively conventional as well. So um, I thought that this is really a good uh, fit just so the next person can maybe have a little bit more basic information to go on. Nothing I'm doing here is rocket science, but it seemed like it was a bit challenging to just get those, you know, pond, management 101 with a regenerative focus, like it didn't seem like there was a lot um, of useful information out there to go on. So um, again, you know, that's kind of the value of what we're doing here. So a bit on permaculture. Um, this is a big topic, you know, there's a lot of those keywords that we can talk about. For me, why it's useful is um, it gives us a shared language to talk about really interdisciplinary things. Um, so this isn't, again, like something new, it's just a really useful way to think of um, your design process, whether in this case it's a pond or whether it's your whole farm or whether it's one tiny enterprise on it, you know, it's just a great methodology for working from big to small and really getting to a, um, you know, most correct, I guess, for you, you know, um, conclusion quicker. So. Um, I'm just going to talk about some of these design principles in permaculture that I thought would be most relevant um, to note here as we talk about the pond. Um, so let me see. Because these are the ones you'll see really play out as we continue to talk. So um, let's see, observe and interact, right? I have already mentioned it and I'm gonna mention that a lot. Um, that's what we did for two years, right? We moved in in 2016, our grant project was until 2019, we applied for it in 2018. So those first two years, it was really a lot of observation and interaction, watching the water flow, seeing where the problems are, see where the, you know, like what are those patterns? Um, and before you really start embarking on solving problems, you really need to understand uh, like how they work. You know, catch and store energy, uh, an example of that on our farm would be like, it, you know, installing swales and like holding water higher on the landscape before it gets to the pond or causes erosion. Um, but anywhere like, uh, you know, just like rainwater, right? Like, do you have a ra rainwater catchment system? Maybe it seems like a small thing, but are you finding those opportunities to store and catch energy where you can and where it makes a small difference? Um, obtain a yield, you know, again, that's a principle that's really useful um, as far, in terms of water. What can we get out of a pond, right? Just an example of obtaining a yield uh, would be pumping water for livestock, pumping water for irrigation, right? These are like basic things, but as you start thinking about it, you really identify much more nuanced opportunities as you keep developing that system. Uh, patterns to details again, right? Like I didn't get on this farm and start working on the pond. You really observe the large picture. You observe your patterns of like sunshine and weather and wind, right? Like for example, why does wind matter in, as far as a pond? I'll give you just one simple example of if you have trees, you need a couple trees for shade on the pond. So you're gonna plant a tree. Do you plant it upwind or downwind? on the pond, you, when the wind blows and the leaves fall, do you want those leaves to fall in the water or do you want them to fall ashore, right? Like those just small examples really add up to making a really big difference of whether your system is gonna function efficiently or whether you're always gonna be working against the tide, so to speak. Um, so uh, small solutions, again, right? Like you make small mistakes 
every system is scalable. So if it doesn't work on a small scale, it's not going to work on a large scale, you know, um, and especially with something like water, you know, it's really powerful. So if you put in a wrong solution and you really invest a lot in that, you know, your solution, you're, you're going to be fixing expensive problems down the road. Um, so really like testing those things and, um, and you'll see how this, this will come up throughout the presentation. So I won't get stuck here, but you know, if this doesn't sound right, you guys, if you have more questions on this, please feel free to interrupt at any point. Uh, stacking functions, you know, again, like no, on a farm, we know if you're walking to the barn, like you better carry a few buckets, right? Like you're not going to go somewhere empty handed. Um, this is like that same premise, you know, what can you get out of a pond with least amount of inputs? Like what they, so you'll see that play out, but really it just means like efficiency. And we try to do that all the time on a farm anyway. We're not wasting time and energy. We don't have much to spare. Uh, integrate and don't segregate. I mean, this is just a, such a general universal thing. Um, in this way, we're really just mimicking nature. We hear this in many workshops. I see familiar faces from other workshops. You know, like nature doesn't like monoculture. Regenerative farmers, we don't like monoculture. Same principles apply. You know, permaculture kind of just lets you look at it in that lens. Um, we operate under the understanding that everything is interconnected and working in dichotomies, straight lines, and monocultures is not the solution we need today. So like companion planting is an example. Another would be to integrate water conservation into all aspects of your farm and not just put your pond far away and drain all your water to it because that's your water and this is your farm. Start thinking about integrating water conservation in all aspects um, of the farm, please. We'll talk about um, like site selection for sure. Um, and using the edge and the marginal, you know, like just a small example is um, apple trees thrive best on the edge of a forest. You know, that's where your ecologies are most diverse. That's where you get the most of the forest ecology and the field ecology. So on the edge of your pond, you have so many more opportunities. It creates warm spaces and cold microclimates. It creates a much more of a complex ecology that you really might have opportunity to take advantage of. Um, so those buffer zones, they're not to be overlooked. They can really be um, quite useful. And um, produce no waste. You know, this is just like general guidance. But again, if you think of it from the beginning as you're designing, um, your solutions, you know, build that in so you can have fewest amount of inputs for the most outputs. Um, so we're going to talk about landscape design. Uh, let me see. Hold on, you guys. What do I want to do next? What's our next slide? So, oh, yeah. So I'm just going to um, give you guys, these are just pictures from the farm. So these are examples of um, how these principles play out before in relation to the pond, but before you ever even get to the pond part. Uh, the, on the top left, we have an example of just planting on contour and mulching beds. It's the smallest and most basic way to slow the flow of water on the landscape. Organizing your plantings in relation to your contours is a basic acknowledgement for the flow of water, especially with perennial and deep rooted plants. Um, we're going to discuss those additional measures like swales and ponds, right, in more depth, but just to mention that, like, holding, because well, why do we want to hold water higher on the landscape? Like, why do we not want to drain that away? That's the soil moisture. For one That's right. That's right. Soil is the most efficient thing at holding water. If you have good soil, it holds a great amount of water. And in doing so, you're really stabilizing your water table and helping to eliminate or minimize the drought flood cycle. In time of flood, your soil can, has great water holding capacity. If you drain all that water away, your soil won't hold that water. And then when it stops raining, it won't have that water for use. The gravity will take your water downhill eventually anyway. So if you're able to hold your water higher on the landscape, you're like, that's your most efficient long-term passive solution for um, min building soil and minimizing like drought and uh, flood cycles on your property. So the mushrooms, 
on the um, left. Let me see. Oh, well, I guess the, um, is, so I'll show you guys on the map. This is the next thing I'm gonna do. It, like we, if you notice like our mushroom production tunnel, it's outdoor caterpillar tunnel. We're strategically located downhill from the pond in the swale for the overflow. It is an example of integration into the larger system where we're taking advantage of um, gravity and water flow from the pond to, uh, to create a yield and grow mushrooms using that surplus. And then finally, uh, the picture of the pigs and ducks, that's really to show that, um, you know, a pond is a great resource. So because of it, we are able to take on more water intensive animals and livestock. It's an opportunity that somebody without a pond might not have. For example, for ducks and pigs, they take up a lot more water than like goats and chickens. So um, without the pond, it would be less feasible or more expensive, I should say, to um, for those considerations. So just another small example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about it a little bit, but uh, that we you, we rotate graze like everybody, so nobody gets to stay anywhere too like more than they should. Um, so the ducks on the pond it falls in that same category. Um, yeah. So this is just uh, an excuse for me to include two cute pictures of the pond and the farm, but it's to orient orient you. I'll show you guys the map next. Um, it like the, the one the picture on the left. That's looking westward. So we're standing like by the barn, uh, looking westward over the pond. And then the other, we're standing on the, looking eastward toward that bond, um, toward that barn. So that's, the barn is uphill from the pond. So just as you see pictures, it'll like maybe help you orient a little bit. This is pretty cool. This is a Google Earth map of our farm. And um, it's at a random year, but also just uh, to give you guys an idea of this farm that we designed using permaculture. And now you can see like the pond um, on that farm. So uh, this here is the barn looking westward toward this pond. This is our project. Downhill. That's also downhill. Yes, that's right. So the overall span, or I should say slope, this is the edge of our property. The secondary pond here is really a bog. And it is like, um, I think a long time ago was established as like the overflow pond. So um, in theory, the, well, the water kind of flows that way. So you can see right here, that's our caterpillar mushroom tunnel. It's in a swale where all of this access overflow ends up and also from the road and feeds into the secondary pond. So um, the overall slope from the edge all the way to the top of the property, which is here, is um, it's about 2,000 feet and it's about a 100 foot rise total. So it's gentle, um, but there's like, you know, some flow to it. It's not still. And the picture of... Um, here is really from, I think like a year or two ago. So this is actually, the windmill is not up quite yet. So this is like during, um, during the project. Um, but here, I just wanna point out to you guys the, and I'll come back to it when we talk about the swales, like our plantings here, this is an orchard field, they're all on contour. These plantings here, they're all on contour. This is one of our biggest swale here, it's on contour. Um, I don't have a better like topo map, but you would see like, you know, how kind of like these hills roll and flow like into these areas. Um, there's a little swale right here and that's to catch really mostly the, um, the barn roof flow. And there's a swale right on top of here and that catches the rain from the house, the driveway and like this more compacted area. Our farm is mostly all open land. So the trees is basically the edge of our property. Um, there is like, you know, some like right here, there's, you know, this patch is ours, whatnot, but it's just like standing dead ash. That was part of our proposal. It's like, we're growing a cider orchard on contour. We're planting like everything from locust to chestnut to oak, 
Um, we kept a lot of the original, like we found a ton of, well, just over a hundred little white seedlings um, in one acre on the kind of we'll call our back 40, like on the other side of the, the mushroom tunnel, like it's Northwest facing, it's far away, like wildlife predators, not much we can do there. So that's like on contour, just really more, more or less like that's the forest that we're growing that has like oaks and alder and pine. And um, we're envisioning that like in 10 to 20 years to be like a really cool per perennial medicinal, you know, um, like mushroom landscape. Um, and next, so now we're gonna get into like, what is a healthy pond? Um, I mean, I guess the first thing you could say is like, why do you care if your pond is ecologically healthy? Like, how does that relate to my farm? But if we have to go that far back, you know, that's like a different presentation. So, I mean, we're going to say that our values are that we want an ecologically healthy pond, right? Because, um, well, that, we'll stop there because we got to we're, yeah, all right, we'll keep going. So uh, what is a pond? A pond is a freshwater, still body of water, smaller than a lake. In essence, it is surface storage of fresh water, especially on a farm. And on a permaculture farm, is a, a pond is a tool in the toolkit. Um, what are its features? Ponds can, are mostly man-made or spring-fed. It has oxygen levels to support fish life and consequently like a healthy pond ought to support a, the whole food chain. Um, so like in a small example, you know, we have turtles, they might eat the fish, they eat the insect or like zooplankton that eats the phytoplankton, which consumes carbon dioxide and sunshine. It produces oxygen and like they're right. Like that whole complex ecosystem that exists, um, in a pond if it has the right conditions. Um, so a healthy pond supports a complex ecosystem. And if anything is out of balance, there is a chain reaction. Uh, good pond stewardship involves observing for symptoms of imbalance and managing to restore this balance. Too many cattails or duckweed, what does that mean? And what could that lead to if left unmanaged? So there's important considerations for building or managing a pond. Construction is one. Um, the picture on the bottom right is just supposed to demonstrate, um, you, you know, th this is not like an all, it's just an example of good pond construction and the things that you think about, like, are you on a slope? You know, do you have fill for dam? Like, how do you construct it? Um, so like the construction, it's like the bones, the skeletons, the structure, the foundation of the pond. Is it designed and built in a way that this pond will easily support pond life? Its depth relative to the surface area. For like a one acre pond, you would want a 12 foot deep pond in its deepest area, for example, right? The slope, you want gradual slope on one side, for example, you want a steep drop on the other side, you create diversity of habitat for plants, for fish, for temperature, et cetera. You're diversifying your pond with its construction. The same considerations go for the edge of the pond. You know, if you have one tree downwind from the pond and a few cattails, that's great. But if you have like 80% coverage by trees and cattails, this creates an imbalance. And what could that lead to, right? What are the consequences of that? Uh, the dam is, if you're constructing a pond, like we, our pond, you know, it has a dam. Is it wide and tall enough to be structurally sound? And what safety measures are built into that? Like, do you have a proper overflow pipe? And these days, you know, if you have, like, what's the watershed feeding into your pond? Is that, is it right sized? And then, you know, like in these catastrophic times, right? And the rains that we've been having, you really have to think about that, like even more. Um, is your overflow pipe sufficient? Do you have a secondary overflow opportunity? Um, will your pond stay full or is it gonna dry out? Um, like the, what are the consequences of having a really intense drought season? Uh, so, you know, and then uh, the second thing that's really important is diversity. It is the surest symptom of health We've been hinting at this, you know, leaving room for different depths in the pond allows for varying temperatures. 
to satisfy various forms of life. Some critters like shade, some like sunshine on the surface of the water. Managing for diversity is key. Not allowing for dominance by one species or anything to like take over. Um, so we have, you know, different types of diversity you're looking to establish. Depth, temperature, sunlight, species of plants, species of animals. So every pond, oh, is, um, so the other pictures I should mention, you know, again, they're just meant to show like the top right is that what are the different types of plants that you have? Like what's that diversity, you know? Some grow on shallow water in the edges, you know, like the cattails. Some don't even have roots to the bottom of the pond, you know, they're just living on the surface. And they all have, you know, the ones that grow on the bottom, like they, they all have a different role to play. Some create oxygen, like, et cetera. So it's just, once you start looking at ponds, you know, there it's like, there's so much to it. So I'm just really touching the surface, pun intended. Um, and then the bottom left, I'll come back to that in the references. That's just the map of Sepp Holzers, if you guys have ever heard of them, like in Austria, like, you know, a lot, if that's a resource. So just an example of how complexly your water can fit into your landscape. I mean, like you really like start thinking about the flow, like that map is really complicated. There's a lot of layers to it. Um, it's something to keep in mind that, you know, it, the more nuanced it is, the more fitting into the landscape it probably is. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk about our pond now. Um, this was not a healthy pond. There are plenty of symptoms to tell us this much. Uh, they historically, so this was common in the 1960s or so, this was built as a, as a fire insurance policy on the farm, right? It's really rural. Um, unfortunately, it was in fact used for that purpose to put out a fire on that farm in the 70s. Um, but that was its intended use, its only intended use, and that is the only way that it was constructed. And, you know, um, it wasn't like... A lot of this was not taken into consideration, right? There was like drain tile that was fed into it. Um, and that, that's about it. So there are, we have met folks that lived there in the past or like, you know, old time neighbors. And there's tales of like great fishing on that pond. You know, the, there was great like fish stock and all that. But at some point the management ceased. And with time, we really learned why there are not many ponds in nature. Um, they fill in with organic matter. Trees want to grow, like life happens and it will, if left unmanaged, the conditions will inevitably lead it to turn into a wetland. And in some ways that could be a good thing. But again, it depends on your goals. Um, so uh, eventually, you know, um, like, but this pond was in fact zoned agriculturally and on our pond or on our farm, the situation is that uh, because of the like, historic pollution, et cetera, like there's no well um, and we don't have city water. So we have a cistern and our water gets trucked in. That's not very cost effective. It's not very sustainable. Um, so the, having an agriculturally zoned pond is really valuable. So, and we are in, thankfully, you know, surrounded by national park. There's another wetland just down the road, you know, so there's plenty of wildlife habitat. Um, so we didn't feel like too guilty that we really need to preserve this wetland for the wildlife habitat because it really has that potential. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of like in defense of our pond restoration versus choosing another path is that for us, it's valuable and I'm guessing it is for you. And that's why, you know, you guys are thinking about doing it too. Um, so that's what it looked like. We're standing like somewhere by the barn, looking downward. I'm going to show you guys a few more pictures of, um, what the pond looked like, uh, the before, if you will. So on the left, you know, you, um, that's, on the south edge, you see like the cattails are like 10 foot deep into there. Like the trunks of the trees are pretty, um, you know, hefty. Like the, on the right there, that's the dam. That's like a giant tree among many other trees like growing on the dam. Um, and why is that not a good thing to do to grow trees and shrubs on your dam, anyone? Like, yes, 
That's right. Yes. Yep. You're totally on that. I mean, who would have thunk it, you know, uh, but there they are. So now, like, now what do you do? Right. Like, if they're already there, um, how do you handle that? So just a few more pictures here. Um, so now I'm going to share with you guys like our goals for our pond, right? This is a really important step. Identify all of your goals. Uh, we want to sustain a fish population to generate yield with minimal inputs. We want to create recreation with a small dock, a canoe, a swing rope, you know, the whole thing. Because um, we're dreaming big. We'd like to pump water for livestock and irrigation and for mushrooms and gardens, you know, in case of drought, what have you. We would like to maintain or create some wildlife habitat as well with our pond because we realize that that diversity in ecology is just going to be better for our yields throughout the farm, for our cider, for pollination, for all of those things. It's valuable for the farm to have better wildlife as well. Um, we would like to manage a secure water storage for the farm as that insurance policy as well for ourselves. And we would like to create a whole farm water system that improves the environment around it. So uh, what's next? In 2016 to 2018, we... Um, observed and we interacted. This is not to be underestimated. This is the, the most essential part, really. Um, we observed it in drought and in flood, like in all four seasons. We saw the patterns of where the broken drain tile was flowing really poorly. You know, I, at some points there were like creeks that were past my knee deep, you know, rushing water in parts of our fields when we first got there. Um, you know, and there's, you watch, that's an important step. And then um, step two is like you implement small and slow solutions. Um, this is the place to mention uh, soil health, again, not to be underestimated for its water storage capacity. By building good soil, you are building that in and it is, you know, um, water improved soil, soil improved water, et cetera. Uh, let's see. So in those two years, um, we evaluate, it was really important step is that we worked with the partners that we have, which was the National Park Service and their biologists to do like a species evaluation of our pond, a pond in the surrounding area to actually make sure that we weren't um, causing great damage to uh, the habitat in case there was like really significant wildlife species. Um, and then uh, we, uh, let's see here. So we mulched one contour um, and then the, we installed like three permaculture soils, right? So that's, um, that was the piece that we did before even, again, like before really jumping on the pond. Um, how can we fix everything around it, everything that feeds into it? So then where we're actually fixing the pond, you know, um, that's, that's the final step. It's not the first step. On the top left there, right on the edge of the barn, that was our first and smallest swale um and that's the one we kind of did and hung on to for six months because we really just wanted to see like is this how it works so there that picture is um like when it was first constructed and filled and you could see our fluck of um mostly muscovy ducks there and um so we learned from that and it was really effective and so our pattern for construction is uh, with our slope um, is to make the swales wide and shallow and uh, put the berm on obviously, I, I mean, I suppose maybe it's obviously, but like downhill, right? So you have a slope and then you have a swale and then you have a berm and then additional slope. Uh, both of those create great opportunities for various types of plantings. Um, so this was our smallest and then on the, right there, that larger picture, um, that's our second largest and closest to the pond. It catches everything from the house, from the yard, 
like our gutters from our house all um, collect and flow out into the field. And that um, outflow is strategically right, feeds right into that swale. Um, and that's been really effective to watch. And uh, all that orchard field is planted just downhill from that swale. The swale is as high on that field as we can put it. We could have put that swale at the bottom of that field, but we chose to put it as the top row of that field. Because as that water absorbs in, it's inevitably watering and feeding the roots of all of those trees in those lower rows. Um, and that's essential. So another uh, experiment that we did that really worked well with the swales because then you have the like you have subsoil right it's compacted you just excavated like how do you fix it um we tried uh, we have really heavy clay soils i should add right so that was an extra um Hassle. So in some places we did uh, seed cover crop mixes, um, but then the because I grow mushrooms on the farm as well, right? So then we experimented very successfully filling those swales with wood chips and planting them with uh, wine caps, trifaria mushrooms. Um, and I found that to be extremely effective to absorb all that water and improve the soil downhill. Like in, the in that field where we did the swale, filled it with wood chips, fed it with those mushroom mycelium, those trees and any other alley crops they planted were very visibly healthier, stronger, better over the course of like two years of implementing that. Permaculture swales, they are solutions to problems. They're meant to be temporary storage of water. Somewhere like there's um, like key lime plows and broad forking, and then there's ponds. And then there's th like swales are in the middle, like it's a middle solution with organic matter or you have to plant them. Um, they're not meant to be like permanent storage solutions. They slow the flow of water and absorb that water higher up on the landscape over, you know, a day or two or whatnot. They hold those heavier rains temporarily while your soil is not capable of absorbing it right away. So like in a really heavy rain, when you have that potential for flood, but you've only been on your farm for a few years, so your soil is not perfect yet, like a swale is a way to kind of hold it for a minute yeah and um you know this is just so the wood chips really worked and they helped to improve the capacity the absorption capacity of those swales really well on the bottom left there the picture this is the one that's east of the barn and um that was definitely like too large to find sufficient like wood chips for so you know it really depends on your scale but that's where we um uh, we planted cover crops a couple of times, but um, it, uh, we integrated our ducks on that swale to improve the soil there. And that was obnoxiously uh, successful as well, I should say, because um, in the, you know, like February, early March, you start a flock of ducks, they're in the barn under the heaters then it's like spring, they're ready to go out. And by now, oh, with the spring rains and all this like mosquito larva is like starting to form. And if you time it right, then like those young ducks from like five weeks to seven weeks or, you know, whatever um, um, layers, even old, like they just indulged. Like it was, it was really cool to see how much they loved it, how much they consumed as much standing water as we've been encouraging on the farm. Um, so using ducks in that way has been really successful. Um, okay, I'm going to move on. We should... So those are all the things that we did before we attacked the pond. Uh, let's see here. We invited a 24, we hired out a, for a 24 foot excavator to clean the growth around the edges. Um, he, his goals were to clear the growth, build up the bank, to gain up some depth, secure the dam with installing an overflow pipe. Um, we couldn't start the work until June of that year, it, mostly because the conditions were so wet that spring. 
Um, so it was a later start than we wanted, but nonetheless, um, so he sliced the dam just enough to drain the pond um, just enough so the edges could dry so he could actually pull like all the stuff out of it. Um, it really, so we have our pond is maybe like three quarters of an acre. And um, he did like in less than a week, the whole project was done. Like in five days, I mean, a really like savvy hand of who's done this kind of work before, it was really efficient. Um, we paid him 5,000 of that, $5,000 of that grant went to, um, to his work. And um, it was worth every penny um, as far as just watching somebody like really expert doing it. It, it is something to take into consideration where your location is. It's like, what is the least amount of disturbance for the most tra possible transformation? So you're gonna, you know, and that's why you have to be measure twice, cut once. Like really think it through, you know, could we have done a total dredging of this pond? Like, sure, but then you might as well pull all those trees off the dam, et cetera. But then that turns into like a $50,000 project, right? So, um, you know, how little can you do to like really maximize your effect? Like if we couldn't hire the 5,000, you know, we consider like we could do this by ourselves, you know, have a couple work parties, grab a couple chainsaws, like, but, um, you know, like the, that's not, that, that wasn't right either, right? So you just have to kind of find the right size solution. So taking the size of the equipment, the compaction they're gonna cause, like all of that, like definitely needs to be taken into consideration. So part of our grant is that we did um, do like a lot of the measurements. And uh, I think originally it was in fact 12 feet, which it would have been about 11 feet. Um, and then, so, at the start of the grant in 2016, before the excavation, the deepest part was about eight feet, maybe eight and a half if you really press the stick into the muck. So um, we thought that uh, since the bank had eroded in some parts, but in some parts we had a little bit extra, that um, we could in fact build the bank up enough where it had deteriorated in order to build the bank to its original height and that would give us enough depth. So yeah, the um, the excavator was really important to do this, the, the, the redo the construction, that structure of the pond. So how much depth can we do? Like how many of those cottonwood trees and autumn olive can we remove from the edge and willows? <coughs> and then we have to just kind of wait a minute and wait for the pond to fill up again, right? There's a huge disturbance you install the overflow, you, um, you know, repair the dam where it was sliced, and then you kind of hold off a minute, right? Like, so um, in, uh, in that time, we were the, using the BCS to till in cover crops, um, which I should give a shout out to Walnut Creek Seeds for really great insight about how to mix proper uh, cover crop seeds for like for our application and also to earth tools for the awesome BCS we got from them. I love that thing. Um, it's been really useful. And I never once dropped it in the pond. Um, so the, I should say, so after the excavation, because like, you know, he really made it nice on the edges, but it was just like subsoil clay. Um, the first time I seeded in the cover crops, like it was obviously like poor germination, um, but we did put in some, uh, I think it was like some sort of a radish or turnip, right? Something like deep rooted and those had pretty good success. And I was also really surprised um, how well the sunflowers grew. Um, there were some really massive sunflowers that first summer. Um, so, and then the pond didn't fill it until December because we had that year, like obnoxiously a lot of rain in the first few months. And then we had that really, really long dry season. Uh, so we were a little worried, like, are there going to be like, you know, is there going to be too many mosquitoes? Like, was, are we ruining it by not filling it? You know, should we fill it with an alternative way? Um, but that seemed fine. Like nature's slow. And I, we, I don't think anything bad happened because we um, waited too long. But then the other thing that we did uh, as part of the grant, so, okay, we're looking to increase depth because our pond's not deep enough. We have like way too much growth around the edges. So we 
took care of that problem. We also at that point had zero oxygen levels, zero dissolved oxygen in the water, which means like fish population cannot live. Um, so that was our third like big main challenge. And our first attempt at the smallest solution possible it was to install this windmill to aerate the pond. We don't have electricity down there. It would be expensive, cost prohibitive to, for us to run it. Um, so let's see what this can do. This is a 16 foot uh, windmill. Um, I got it from Fenders down in, I don't know what county that is, maybe Tuscarawas or something like that. And um, it, it spins and it's got a tube and that tube goes all the way to the bottom and you, um, and you attach that to a porous stone, which is kind of like a diaphragm. And you put that inside of a five gallon bucket with some stones in it and you swim it out through all that duckweed and the muck to the middle of the pond and you drop that bucket to the bottom. So then every time the wind blows, that air is pushed to the bottom of the pond and as tiny, tiny little air bubbles starts to push oxygen and air from the bottom of the top, from the bottom of the pond to the top. And ideally what you're creating is just like a moving airflow in the water and you're breaking up those layers and really like starting to stir things up in a good way. Um, what we found out is that, um, you know, we, we're on a ridge, Western facing, we have immense winds and we're like, yes, windmill, this is gonna be awesome. It's gonna blow all the time. And it does, except for like July, when your weed pressure is the highest and the winds like really don't blow. So that's an example of um, like, you know, that was a problem that we ran into um, is when you need that tool the most is when it's least effective. So for us, like this is not sufficient. And the cattails were into the water. He did the whole all around. He was able to maneuver his excavator even on, on the dam. And, and that's our steep slope into the water. And he did a really great job. There were some like really large trees that were starting to kind of fall in um, even and die into the water. And then um, on the eastern edge is where the water feeds into the pond. So the slope is really gradual. And he, there was a lot of, you know, thin willows mostly and cattails. And so he was able to get like, you know, past the cattails and bring all that in. In one place we were able to ask him, like he layered for kind of a future hugel culture bed, right? Like all of that debris. I'm like, can you lay it on contour? Like right there, you know, so you don't go too far, but it'll be useful maybe later. But the rest of it, he buried, he buried. And that's where we got some extra fill dirt from. I, um, and this was a disturbance that I didn't take into consideration before. I didn't know that he was going to do this. So he like next, um, next to the pond, like, so he didn't have to go too far to, you know, cause there was so much debris, right? Like there was so much stuff to do something with. And so he dug like a 20 foot hole, tw like 20 foot circumference and like 20 foot deep. It's basically, he's like, it's like one of those storage units is how like he sized it to me. And, and he just packed like all the stuff in there and then just kind of covered it uh, with the subsoil. But then he had some subsoil to work with. Um, but that, you know, and now over the years, I'm watching that spot as it's all like composting there. It's all like sinking, you know, and so just that, but that's what happened. I don't know yet. Like I, I, like, I don't, you know, why haven't it, like, it already happened. There was nothing I could do about it. But it's like, you know, some people might think that might be too much disturbance for you, right? Like, is that necessary? Would you rather just leave it on top and let it compost because you don't mind that ginormous compost pile? You know, but like, but he thought, you know, he, he's a contractor. So, you know, he's doing what he's doing. And he's like, well, you need fill dirt. Like, where am I going to put this? Um... All right, so we're still on the first year of the project now. Like the hard part's been done and um, now like the expensive part, I should say. And now it's all free labor by the farmer, right? Um, so let's see, this is still, so, oh, so the windmill, I should say, this is a 16 foot windmill. Um, we were able to assemble it ourselves, you know, just some pictures so you guys can size it. Like people standing next to it, you know, like four of us could, assemble that thing on a weekend and put it up. No problem. That's not like a giant project. Um, but selecting the location for that windmill, you have to be really thoughtful. Like 
you know, is it going to, ma are you maximizing the wind potential for that windmill? Uh, so then the next year, you can see, like, and that's what the edge looked like where those kids are standing, you know, the cattails, they come back so immediately, you know, like the weed, you're like, okay, we're immediately needing to manage it already. So in the top left, you know, the cover crop seeding, like we had great results, but then like in 2020, I did that again. Um, on the right, like we did a lot of manual removal of weeds. Uh, the motorized tool, the weed whacker, we have like a really good farm-sized weed whacker, you know, um, it, that was a really good tool to invest in. Um, it worked really well for us, but the rake was really great to go behind and pull all that um, organic matter then out of the pond because you, you don't want to start filling it back up already, right? Um, and we did, AM Leonard has some really good tools. So if your pond is like less than a half acre or like a quarter acre or less, like um, there's some really affordable tools that we tested on our farm and they worked really great. Um, you know, these like razor sharp kind of things that cut through the cattails. If you don't have like a weed whacker to work with, like there's manual tool. You don't need fossil fuels is what I'm saying. If your pond is like under a half acre um, to manage the weeds. So uh, we did attempt, we're testing this. I haven't, if you guys know somebody who knows how to harvest duckweed effectively, please tell me. We worked on it and worked on it. There was like you know, manual removal of duckweed is really hard if for no other reason that it's heavy because it's so darn wet. So you can collect it, but like the weight of it to get it out of the pond and out, um, we didn't find a good solution. We used nets. We had like two paddle boards and we tried to like make the nets, you know, like strong and capable of lifting. Like it just seems like that would be a worthwhile research project because the amount of duckweed I was able to pull out of that um, and give to our chickens, they do in fact love it. Like they did eat it up. Um, removing duckweed is placing your labor inefficiently because the extreme duckweed, because we still have it, it's a symptom that the core of the problem has not been solved. So instead of wasting my time, like carrying duckweed, like how do I get to the core to make the pond so it's not so attractive for so much duckweed? Are there other species I'm supposed to introduce? Is there not enough air still, like right moving? Or what are those things so you can really like, you know, um, get to that part? So, and that, so another thing that I did in the second year, especially was the rotating of the ducks around the pond. Um, I hope we all know that leaving animals anywhere too long is a bad idea. Same with the ducks. If I let the ducks live on that pond, it would just be a muck pond again. They would fertilize it way too much. Like it would, it would lead to problems. Um, but how do you mob graze ducks? Like they're, <laughs> they can fly away or swim away or like, you know, I mean, depending on the type of bird you have, like some, some like to swim, some like to fly. Um, I would say that we evaluated three different types of ducks. The Muscovies, these brown buffs or golden layers, like depending on which catalog you're looking at, and the Muscovies um, to see like which ones worked better or worse and what type of housing they needed. Um, we considered like building them an island um, so they could nest and stay out there um, to relieve predator issues. We chose not to do that because we needed them to fertilize the edge of the pond, but also because we don't, um, our ducks, we don't have too many predators for our ducks. Um, or we didn't until this winter because the pond for different story. But um, for the duration of the pond, like we really didn't have great, like, uh, you know, especially in the warmer season when the pond's not freezing over, like ducks can just be out on the water and that's enough um, security for them. And we built these shelters. It was really effective. They really... Um, the pecans like really surprised how like they really did not make a dent in the duckweed. They like, barely, they ate it, but it was not anything. Um, but with the impact they had around the edge alongside the cover crops was really impressive. Like I really like running ducks um, to improve the soil, our clay soil. They're fertilizing like everything. They eat all the bugs. Like they're really, really useful. So again, like in the standing water with all this duckweed and not enough aeration, we had like no mosquito issues. And to me, that symbolizes that we like, you know, that they're doing their work. Um, so as we were observing the consequences of our actions, even in 2020, we were evaluating that as predicted, like this was not a one and done. This was just the beginning of a pond restoration. It was the first big step, if you will, to bring this pond back to life 
And SARE really funded like the most valuable step um, in this process. Um, without them, we really couldn't have afforded to get going on this at all. Um, so in 2021, we took the time to let the dust settle, so to speak, and we conducted some minimal management. Uh, we removed cattails and mowed the edges, um, like that riparian buffer zone, about three times last year to really make sure none of that was going to seed or um, spreading at all. We also started pumping water to livestock. I found a really amazing little solar powered pump. Um, it's called Nemo Pump, N-E-M-O. Um, it just takes like a hundred watt uh, solar panel, like a little battery, and it is powerful. It pumps water for my livestock, um, 80 foot rise, 1600 foot run. On a sunny day, I stand there and with the hose and water is running out, like not trickling, but like moving. So I, and I don't think the company makes anything else, but they make a really solid um, uh, submergible pump. And uh, let's see, so we definitely got that pump and we've been um, messing with it. The only thing to it is really that the duckweed <laughs> clogs it in July when you need it most. So filtration is uh, a key step there. Um, oh, well, I, it depends on how far it goes. The, um, I don't remember then. I don't remember. I don't remember. I know it, it's supposed to come with like a gallon per minute thing, but I don't remember what that number is. Um, so uh, the other thing in 2021 that happened is that we found finally, I don't know why it took us so long, a great company to work with, with uh, for technical expertise and products. Um, one of their reps is sitting right here, Amanda. She can answer us some um, uh, technical questions if we have them. Um, and then we evaluated opportunities to like fix that spillway that didn't get substantially built up um, to build it up or to create an... Um, so when we were digging out and we got that extra fill dirt, right? Because we needed to build up the bank where it had deteriorated over time of mismanagement. Um, it, it, really, it wasn't sufficient. Like we really didn't have enough fill dirt to build, build it up enough. And we didn't have the funds to bring in more fill dirt and compact it enough and do all, all that work. So we kind of paused um, because another observation that I had is that the spillway over time was kind of like creating this wetland habitat. We started identifying like wet gland, um, wetland plants, you know, even like native useful ones like in that space. And in further research, I thought, well, that would be kind of neat. We have the overflow pipe and that could be kind of like our emergency secondary measure instead of our primary measure. And our initial one can in fact be a more, like a better managed overflow system into a little like wetland seasonal pool. And um, what would that look like? And how much space would be dedicated to it? And then where would that overflow feed, you know? So now I'm like thinking, like now that the construction of this is as set as it is, like what are other opportunities to kind of complicate matters and actually like diversify the habitat a little bit more? Um, having a space like that might also help with like that water filtration step um, and things like that. So basically, you know, 2021, like we really paused because we also had um, a couple other like massive priorities on the farm. And, um, you know, we did minimal management, but really kind of evaluated like, okay, you know, now like what are the challenges that we still have going forward? Which things did we get to a point where we can just now kind of manage it? And what can we check off our list as like really like accomplishments and like what have we actually accomplished in this time? So um, I just talked about 2021. So then um, these are our planned activities for uh 2022 going forward um we're gonna you know we still need to gain depth so right at first we tried to gain depth by building up now we will introduce the wetland thing is a dream right but like what we will actually do in 2022 like a technical solution that will get us results right now is that we're going to introduce microbes to gain depth by digging down i didn't know about this again like I wish in my year one, I kind of feel a little silly, right? Because I wish in like 2016, I could just like Google this stuff and it would just be like, you know, these are your solutions. You can dredge your pond for $50,000. You can, you know, 
introduce some microbes for a hundred dollars, you know, or you can do this, that, and the other. These are the species that you want to introduce to your pond, you know, like it just, it, um, it seemed like I was really just kind of like, like, why didn't I come across this before? It like blew my mind. Um, Cause I really was like actively researching, you know, my research for this was, there's a couple good professors I shouldn't understate, like at OSU that do pond um, management or have a lot of pond research done, you know, so they were really useful, but it seemed like, anyway, that's a side note that um, not enough information out there to go on or maybe too much, right? Go ahead. So we didn't have like an algae problem though. So like, um, you know, and again, like I, what I realized is that I, I really didn't want to um, like just fix problems because I knew that at the core, the pond just wasn't healthy. So it's kind of like, you know, I don't want to just fix this problem. And this problem is this problem is like, what can I do to actually just build a healthy pond? So um, it seemed like in our case, the pond was so deteriorated that it was really important to take kind of like those, we needed bigger solutions at that point, you know, and the pond was like large enough to where it, it you know, things like that. It's like, it's too risky and a, a little bit costly to kind of like, you know, so the uh, microbes are neat and um, they're basically like microbes are just bacteria, right? And um, they consume anaerobic or aerobic um, organisms and they have helped to basically like in the most general sense, again, is like to diverse, diversify your ecology and put some soldiers in there that will do the thing that's not currently being done. Like what is the gap in your closed loop system, right? If there's like a complete food chain, what's missing? Like in your situation, like, is it too much algae or is it too much this? Is it too much that? Like what is missing that's causing those symptoms? So like uh, what we are gonna do this year, we're gonna introduce microbes in a prescribed um, expert supported amounts and times. And we are gonna increase air circulation by figuring out how to um, get more solar power to, because um, the windmill, we, we can install multiple more windmills, but one windmill is not gonna add more oxygen um, flow. So we're, uh, it looks, you know, you still use those stones that bubble from the bottom, like those aerators, but now we just need to discover a, an affordable but additional energy source to power those aerators. Evidently, aeration like is more more effective when you're pushing like those fountains. They're beautiful and they have other value, but um, what I found is that they're not actually as efficient. And additionally, we don't have electricity down at the pond, and for us, it's a very limiting factor. So the windmill seemed like the most affordable first um, solution to introduce and to see what results that got us. Um, and so now it's even, and we kind of knew it wouldn't be enough, but I really just wanted to see that for myself, like what does not enough look like? And um, so, you know, so it seems like for our size pond, again, which is about three quarters of an acre, you'd need um, like about three, three aerators at the bottom. Um, and that ought to be like sufficient to get things going more. So yes, you need like in one way or another, you need to create um, air circulation or water movement, like you need to aerate your pond. That's why they don't exist in nature unless they're spring fed. You know, sitting water is like flow, flowing water is like the healthiest water, like rivers, right? It's filtered, it's, et cetera. But um, so th that's one, you need to make sure that it has like all of that habitat and all of that opportunity for all of the life forms to exist that would create that like complete life cycle. Um, so by a couple of years, I hope that Again, like if we want to maximize yields from the pond, like how cool is it that I can introduce an annual fish that is fed by my weeds that helps to improve my pond. And then in the fall, I have an annual fish harvest. I mean, who doesn't want like a farm to table fish in Ohio, you know? So like it might not be um, like an, a silver bullet, right? But it, it, it's useful. It'll be, I'll invite you out for the barrel fish catching party. That would be, you know. <laughs> Um, that could be a fun event, but you can see how like that opportunity can like evolve and like, you know, you can creatively incorporate that um, into it. So, yeah, so our goals, like, you know, we won't accomplish it this year, but I think it's really realistic that within three years, like what we will be able to accomplish our kind of ultimate goals is to introduce the um, bass and bluegill population to um, into the pond. And then within a couple of years, you know, you can even diversify that even further. Um, to me, that's kind of 
I don't know. Um, I think it's valid to kind of take that as a measure of success, you know, that you can really like just su sustain a healthy fish population. Um, we would like to implement, you know, so then again, like once that done, like what, how is this pond like a really valuable part of the whole system? So, you know, we're pumping a little bit um, to use that water, but how cool would it be to actually pump a lot of that water uphill feed that through our swales and orchards to passively irrigate it and then to kind of feed it back into the pond and create like a constantly flowing water on your um, water system. Yes, uh, considerations for your pond management. Define your goals. Why do you have a pond? Why? And is there another reason? And is there a third reason? Is there a fourth reason? What are you trying to get out of it? Like why? Why do you manage a pond? Um, and list all those reasons, um, all of your needs from it, and then design that from the big system to the small system. If there, you have goals for the pond, is it possible that you can actually achieve those goals by doing something upstream? You can maybe do something smaller upstream. You know, if your pond is always flooding, can you slow that water uphill so it doesn't, you know, before it gets to the pond? Um, you know, again, like small and slow solutions make small mistakes. Um, they're a lot easier to fix, um, observe and respond to feedback. You know, nature's always going to tell you what's working and what's not working. Um, she'll reward good behavior and she'll, you know, punish the bad behavior. So, um, like you'll know if you're messing it up, it, it, you know, it's not like rocket size at the end of the day. Like if I can do it, you can definitely do it. Um, so I think like once you start asking yourself those questions about like, well, and now you have a second goal for it, right? And then you have a third kind of goal for it that's maybe a little kind of fuzzy still because you just think it's a potential opportunity, yeah, right? So like once you really start like asking yourself those questions to push your idea further and further, like then I think the answer will kind of present itself about the site um, the site selection, you know, um, so you obviously want it placed closer to that one acre to the garden, right? So you don't have to pump the water too much. Um, is there, I mean, when you say flat, is it like a hundred percent slow, you know, flat, or is there in fact like a teeny tiny slope to it, right? So, um, is there any like roofs or driveways or roads or other surfaces from which you're really collecting water, um, that you can locate that pond in a way that really catches the most possible, the most, you know, of, of the, of available water, um, you know, like th things like that is what's really going to drive your idea forward. And then sketching that out on a map, it's like, okay, well, let's draft this out. You know, this is probably the wrong answer, but let's see what happens. Like if I put the pond over here, what does that mean? Right? Like, and then you like play that out on paper. Like what are all the consequences? It's like, well, this is really close to, you know, like the forest, we might attract more wildlife, or this is potentially too close to the road and I know they spray that road so all that water from the road is going to go into my pond right so like you really start developing that idea and just like drafting after drafting after drafting of it um, and then really identifying that that is in fact the right size solution one I would like to introduce Amanda because um, she works for Inspired by Nature and that company is right outside of Toledo um, and the gentleman who runs it is also like um, in the permaculture frame of thought um, and they um, you know I, I'm really looking forward to having them give me guidance as to like my next steps and more now that I can dive like into more of the technical you know the um, aspects of it. And they are a really good source for a lot of this information. Um, but as far as um, <clears throat> like, so the basic tools that I used for contours and maps and figuring out the slopes and all that is on a small scale, uh, you ought to build yourself an A-frame. It is a really fantastic exercise to really feel what contours are all about and to really like own that concept. Because after a while, what that helps you to do is really just kind of feel the contours, you know what I mean? Um, so you won't be so uh, like dependent on that external um, uh, information. Because there's definitely like topo maps. And if you, there's these days, there's like really fantastic apps out there that I'm like way too old to be savvy about, but um, that will like just 
give you like really detailed topo maps. Like I know they exist. Um, some of them like can be a little bit outdated as far as like if you've been on the property, like water flows and contours, especially in smaller spaces, like change. So what it says on the map, like you should definitely measure your own contours um, in that space, like as you're making those decisions too. And then um, the A-frame is really great, again, just as an educational tool, but in practical terms, um, I got a really nice laser level. It was a big investment for me at 600 bucks, but I got the nice one. And I, I really have gotten all my, a lot of bang for my buck on that because I can use it by myself out on the field. It is like precise to an inch. Um, it has been like really, uh, really precise. An A-frame is um, the most basic way to build the level like a tool for measuring level. It looks like an A and you hang a string with a stone um, that, so gravity pulls that stone down. And as it stays on a level, you know, you, you mark the spot on the horizontal part of the A where it's level. And then as you walk it uphill, um, you, I'm, I'm not gonna describe this very well in words because like once you do it, you kind of see the exercise, but it's basically that stone hanging between the A is telling you where it's level and where it's not and by how much. So as you keep going, you can really like keep finding your level line because the stone and the string like always line up as you go. The other tool in our toolkit that because of our circumstances, we weren't allowed to use is a biological control or grass carp. Um, they are uh, invasive and like super controversial, but potentially um, if managed well, it uh, can be extremely effective for helping you clear out weeds in your pond. Well, thanks for coming, you guys.